and then we'll, we'll go to Mike. Great, so just a, a brief background history. So yes, I went to Ohio State. I was actually a pre-med uh, biology major, chem minor, and uh, decided to take a year off. Uh, my dad was a pharmacist, so I grew up in the pharmacy and just went back to pharmacy work. And I'd done some sales work throughout high school and college. And I'm like, pharmacy plus sales equals pharmaceutical sales, right? You know, young kid. So I put all kinds of resumes out. And eventually I, I landed a job with a company called Allscripts uh, in the healthcare industry. I spent nine years with Allscripts doing uh, electronic prescribing and medical records uh, in anything from uh, account management to sales to working with our resellers in sales and training. Uh, after that, I was like, uh, we, I got to a got to a point and uh, wanted to make some sort of shift and change. And uh, long and short is my wife and I got in an argument, which I know never happens with, with families. And uh, the end of it is, is uh, you know, fine, uh, you go find a job. I'll stay home at the time we had three kids. And so she was looking for jobs and I was looking for something different. And uh, she found a job with the Diocese of Burlington. She's like, I don't qualify, but you do. And, uh, and so I applied, they liked me, I liked them. And we moved from uh, Chicago area to Burlington, Vermont, and uh, started our, our adventure there, working with the diocese as the director of stewardship and development, uh, really working with parishes and schools on uh, development best practices, getting in on online giving, uh, fundraising aspects, as well as stewardship of, you know, how, do we, how are we growing disciples in our church today? And uh, basically from there, uh, Vermont is far away from any of our homes. Uh, eventually, we said we want something closer to my parents' starting age. Uh, we were having more children, so we, we said we wanted to be closer to family at some point. Uh, just started lightly perusing around and, and landed on our Sunday visitor. Uh, fell in love with kind of what they did, what they represented, and, and uh, made, made the shift to, to work for our Sunday visitor. Started with, as a senior campaign consultant with our Sunday visitor, uh, did that for about six, six and a half years that I've been with them to start, and then was asked to be a regional manager, and recently now I'm, I'm sales director, so I direct a, a number of our sales channels across our curriculum and offertory solutions and, and publishing solutions as well. Uh, I live in Cleveland, Ohio at this point in time. Uh, I do have seven children, uh, six of which are in Catholic schools. And I don't know, that's, that's probably the, the quick, long, and short. That's awesome. Thank you, Rich. Do you mind just with the titles that you, you gradually elevated from within OSV, can you just add a little bit more detail about what the roles of like, starting with campaign manager, what, what's the scope of responsibility and the type of activity that, and who do you sell to? Sure. Uh, senior campaign consultant was primarily uh, working with parishes on increased offertory and stewardship efforts. So I work, go and talk to a pastor, talk to finance council, look at their financial situation and talk to them about how do you grow your offertory? How do you make an impact instead of, you know, maybe their offertory was, you know, $4,000 a week. How do you get that up to five or $6,000 a week? And, and really work them through a program and a process to be able to, to actually do that. I mostly work with parishes, uh, but become, coming from a diocese, I had a lot of diocesan connections, continued some of those diocesan connections, and uh, started working on some diocesan-wide initiatives to implement the increased offertory effort with, uh, with our Sunday visitor. So that was kind of the, the spark in, in continued movement. Like I said, did that for about six, six and a half years. Uh, then moved to regional manager, which really focused mostly on East Coast, kind of crept into the Midwest a little bit and managed a, a region of salespeople that focused on our uh, offertory solutions, increased offertory, online giving, uh, offertory envelopes, websites, uh, those kinds of products, as well as our, our curriculum group, which focused on our, our basal curriculum solutions, uh, primarily in, in, in parishes and in schools. And then uh, was recently asked a couple months ago to be a, a sales director for our Sunday visitors. So I cover right now inside and outside sales for uh, our offertory solutions across the whole country for curriculum uh, offertory solutions, as well as some of our publishing and other, other products and solutions. Awesome, thank you, Rich. Uh, Mike, what about you? Would you share the same type of story? Um, there's, there's a few 
um, things that I think Rich and I have in common as far as our, our uh, experience working at the diocesan level. Um, but as far as uh, my, my, let's say, educational background, I, I was all over the place. Um, I was in minor seminary um, at a young age. I had an uncle who was um, studying for the priesthood with the Legionaries of Christ. They had invited me out there for a couple retreats, and um, I got, you know, that, that let's say, um, the thought process in my head as far as, you know, should I, would I be a good priest, and, you know, is God calling me to the priesthood? So at an early age, um, that, that was kind of like my discernment process, and um, as I got older, I realized that God was calling me to, uh, to fatherhood and, and to serve the church in other ways. But during my formation, I mean, I feel like this has been a real gift for, for me personally, going through um, two years of novitiate. Um, and one of those years was in Brazil. So I, I studied... Um, I did one of my years in Curitiba in, in Brazil, and I, I learned a little bit of Portuguese while I was down there. So I had studied Spanish during high school. And then, well, you know, Portuguese and Spanish are a little similar, but they're not identical. Mm -hmm. So that was my first, like, openness to the outside international world. And um, I think there's so many things we can learn from other cultures. Um, especially as we serve the universal church. Mm -hmm. um, and so two years of novitiate. I also did two years of humanistic studies in Cheshire, Connecticut. Um, and during that second year, they had asked me, hey, can you go back to Brazil? We need you down there. So um, had that type of, um, let's say, internship mm -hmm. um, outside of the study type of formation. Um, with the with the legionaries and as well as three years of of work in Mexico, so Mexico presented another opportunity where I worked with schools and um, young kids, especially like with retreats on the weekends, and then um, prefect of discipline, which is such an awesome title, right? <laughs> um, I had that for three years, and my friends ask me to this day, Mike, like. I can't imagine you as a prefect of discipline, but yeah, it's, it's kind of an ongoing joke, but it, it was a great, it was a great service or a great opportunity to learn um, about education. And this is, this is where the whole educational background comes into play. Um, that is where I really found my true calling um, in, in uh, the educational world um, was during those three years in Mexico. Um, I was given the opportunity to study in Rome for, for a year at the Pontifical University that, that John mentioned, the uh, Regina Apostolorum. So I um, got my philosophy and some theology studies there in Italy and picked up a little Italian. I don't know if any of you guys have ever taken a class that just is just out of this world because it's so hard to understand, but imagine that same topic being taught to you in a different language. Um, that's kind of what I remember from Italy was trying to learn Italian and philosophy at the same time. So when I, when I discerned out from my, uh, let's say priestly, um, discernment, I, I wanted to continue to serve the church. Mm -hmm. And I knew that, you know, education was such a, a strong, calling for me that I, I went to DePaul and got my degree and, and started teaching and um, taught at a Catholic school. Um, and then I also wanted to serve the diocese. So I, I took a, a, a position as a director of religious education at uh, the parish where I went to school when I was a kid. And I was also teaching there at the same time. So I was what you would call a DRE slash youth minister, slash Catholic school teacher, slash wearer of many hats. Yep. Um, that's what I did for, for seven years. Then I um, was given, uh, let's say, an opportunity to work as a diocesan director. So I took that position for the Diocese of Joliet for two yep. years. Um, and I was the director of youth and young adult ministry. Actually, let's clarify, associate director of youth and young adult ministry. 
And, um, and then I got a call from OSV and they asked me if I wanted to do some part-time work. And I, I actually told them, no, no thanks. <laughs> um, because it was part-time, I was looking for an opportunity to serve my family and all of the above and not have seven different jobs. Right. But when, when a full-time opportunity came up, I got the call and, and it's, the rest has been an amazing ride. Been with OSV for six years and my position within the company or my responsibilities have also changed. Um, started off in as a, as a specifically a curriculum sales representative. And yep. um, over the past years, I've um, taken more of a, let's say a teamwork uh, kind of lead role where I'm helping my colleagues. And, and now I actually have um, four other OSV colleagues of mine that, that I work with as a, as a team leader. Awesome. So it sounds like both of you share a similar story that you were kind of in the church and then came out to work for OSV, still supporting the church, but from the OSV side of it. And do you guys feel like a lot of the OSV team has similar backgrounds or are you guys kind of unique in that you spent so much time within serving the church in those ways? I think we have a little bit of both, right, Rich? I, I, I would agree. I think that there's a, a good mix of people that have served as either principals or catechists or teachers or yeah. uh, in diocesan roles. And there's also a good mix of people that, that haven't. And they've either grown up in the Huntington area or they've um, grown up in different areas and different positions. And so there's a lot of different strengths that we're bringing from a, a number of different resources. Awesome. Um, so that is essentially one of the reasons why I think we wanted to talk to you guys today. And I don't know if you saw Joe's comment, but I'll, I'll just read it to you. So he's I, I'm delighted this group is getting to hear from Rich and Mike. Two of them are the best on, best of the best on the USV team. I learn something new every time I speak with either of them. Um, not that hard, right, Joe? They learn something new for you. <laughs> but wow, uh, that hurts, John. <laughs> Jason's not here, to, so I'm glad you're slamming me. So thank you. Yeah. Well, I felt like <laughs> You, know, you got a good pattern of it. I'm just picking it up. I know. Um, but it sounds like that that types of the type of expertise that you develop from the diversity in your careers would help you a lot with the sales. And it sounds like OSV takes a consultative approach to a lot of the sales, at least in the way that I'm hearing your titles and your descriptions. So would each of you mind just talking a little bit and we're always eager for stories, but talk a little bit about how OSV sells and that it sounds like you described it could be curriculum it could be the parish campaign so just do something in particular that you feel like is especially educational but we'd love to hear more about how you use the knowledge that you gained and the familiarity with the structures to to essentially sell sure I I, I can go ahead and start I, I know that throughout everything that I've worked with o, o, OSV is that it is a very consultative let's sit down and understand the situation that's going on with the with the parish or with the school and uh, come up with a solution that's going to make sense or or work i mean there's definitely sometimes that our solutions may may not be a direct fit right at that time but to be able to create awareness of this is what we do this is how we can serve your parish your school your community uh, i think is something that we really work towards. So just really understanding the situation and then offering solutions or options, uh, connecting them with other parishes or other dioceses that might be in similar situations to really share uh, in, in their experiences so that we can continue to grow as a church. And that's, that's really what we found. And, in, in, you know, the, the pastors and business managers and DREs and PCLs and other people in the, the church uh, staffing uh, world, uh, I think that's that's resounded very well because they they don't have that. It's not you know most of the time we're we're not our goal is not a used car sales pitch. We're not selling here's a widget buy it and here's why you should buy it. We're really talking about like what's going on in your church and then finding solutions within everything that we do to really help them so that they can continue to. Uh, build and grow their church, build their faith community, build the faith of their individual parishioners, and create disciples. And Rich, let me let me ask another kind of depth level question on that one. So I feel like you 
been in different selling environments. So you started in the pharmaceutical sales. Do you feel like this is different than a lot of that? Or is it is it more relationship heavy? Just kind of compare, contrast different types of selling environments. Sure. So I would say that there's definitely some sales environments that are very much more, I'm selling a widget, I'm selling a, a, a something and, and you feature and benefit. And especially like in the industry where, where I was, we were, we were the best and, and OSV is the best. So you can very easily fall back on, well, we've got the best curriculum or we've got the best, this solution. So you should buy it because it's the best. Yeah. And, and OSV is really taking that stronger approach of, instead of just selling the solution, really understanding, understanding the customer's needs. And, and I would say as, as things evolved, even on, on, on the corporate side with all scripts and the medical records, that's really where it evolved to, not just that we're the best, you should buy us because we're the best. Right. It's that what, what is your need and then how, how does that fit in? So I would say some of that evolved over time. And so f some of the solution selling and, consultative approach that we take is is um, is is advanced in that I guess that that sales structure the way we approach things got it and so when you're saying solution selling I know solution selling from the IBM book on on solution selling is that a type of approach that you guys use or an educational approach or is it is it not as formal as that I would say it's probably not as formal as that uh, but there's definitely uh, on the consultative side looking at what are the needs and here are the solutions that fit some of those needs or fit many of those needs and then coming and really bringing about i know in many cases you know parishes would come to me they're like look our offertory is down if we don't do something now we're going to be in, in in a challenging situation and so we talk about offertory and then to talk about really all the other things that are going on at the parish and all of a sudden they become an envelope customer they start using our online giving they start using our websites they start using our curriculum, they start using our increased offertory. So they start really seeing the benefits of each of those, but really to meet their needs. So it wasn't just a, well, we bought this one thing, so we're going to buy everything. It's, it was a, here's where our needs are. Here's where we want to go and where we want to be. And then, and then OSV has a lot of those solutions that are going to fit that mold to really help them to get there. Awesome. Thank you, Rich. Mike, same original question to you. Could you just describe some of the selling scenarios you've been and what your approach is to it? Yeah, I, I use the consultative approach a lot. Um, and it's uh, a lot of it's based on listening and, and where do you want to be? Um, this is a question that sometimes catches people off guard. Like, you know, what is your vision for your parish community? What is your vision for your Catholic school? Like, what are some of those goals? Like a lot of principals on their mind, it's like, I, I need my enrollment to go up. And, yeah. you know, I mean, they're looking at that short-term solution. So not everybody is, um, let's say, enabled with this visionary type process. Um, and so the consultative approach works when you, ha <clears throat> when you have that um, infinite, infinite mind type of, of, of leader. Um, and I got to quote Simon Sinek on his, on his book that uh, Joe um, invited us to read. But it's really like that consultative approach doesn't always work. Some people just want to buy a book. They just want to buy like, hey, what's the plug and play solution? Yeah, I need this tool. So yeah. sometimes that consultative approach works and it works well. And I think that when OSV partners with parishes, with schools, with dioceses, it really, it becomes that partnership. And I think that that is something that we try to, to use in the sales process is that you're not just buying um, a solution. Mm -hmm. You are becoming part of an OSV family. We're here to accompany you. We're here to partner with you in ministry. So those, those, those words of, of comfort, of, of knowing that, hey, we're in it with you, um, that, that does go a long way in the sales approach. Um, so what, I know I'm, I'm sharing a couple ideas here, but what, I, what I'm, I guess, in the gist of things, is that yes, we love using that consultative approach because that set stands us apart from our competitors who are just selling, let's say tools or features or products. We have a lot of um, employees with a ministry, uh, ministerial background or educational background. We understand you know, the operational functions of a parish because we were doing that in our ministry. 
So we, we have a good understanding of what those needs are. Um, but there are some cases where people don't want to even have this conversation. Right. No, I, I'm just here to, to learn about your solution or, hey, I just need to order some books because they just don't have that three-year plan or they've never even been given the opportunity to even think that way. Yeah. Because maybe, maybe they've never been part of a, a brainstorming type of session within their parish um, staff or um, operations. Um, but yeah, I, I really like to, I, I don't ever focus on features mm -hmm. um, when I describe the, the offerings that, we, that we've developed. Um, it's always, what, what are, this is where you want to be. This is what, this is how you want to build God's kingdom. This is how you want to reach more people. Yep. These are some tools that we provide. And if it's a good fit, of course it always is. Um, you know, this is, this is how we can help you. That's awesome. Mike, I love that question. The surprising depth question that you can ask to kind of put people on their heels a little bit and change the change gears in the relationship. Yes. An interrupter. Yeah. Can, can I uh, accent off of, uh, Mike's comment. So there, there definitely are people that aren't looking for a consultative sell. They're looking for, I want to buy the book or I want to buy this solution. I'm comparing these three. How do you compare to these other two price features yeah. and all of those kinds of things? And, and, and really we've learned that as part of the process, that's okay because we're going to get in some of those environments of this is where it's going to be. But then really to ask that deeper question of where are you going with this? or what's the methodology behind this. Yep. And eventually that opens uh, parishes up to have a discussion, a, a little bit deeper of a discussion that it's not just about said features because this is what we're trying to accomplish. And as you learn what they're trying to accomplish, even though they're, they're feature and benefit comparing, you can also share, you know, this is how it's gonna meet your goals. So there is some of that mixing that does come in in many cases as well. Got it. So I want to I want to dig a little more into that how you surface their vision or needs. And so Mike, I love that question that you just you just ask. And so that's a, it, you're in a call with them and you just ask. Do you do much secondary research on them beforehand, or how how do you get to that those like those really important points of knowing what to talk about? Well, I mean, some of it's based on like our current situation. Like I, I, having made phone calls and having worked with parishes right now, we know that there's, there's a strong focus on the digital approach. Yeah. And we, we need to, to meet families where they are as they, you know, experience social distancing, um, blended learning models. Um, so knowing that a lot of times it's, it's just, being aware of the current situation that yep. we're all going. But um, I, I think a lot of times I, I gather my input from a diocesan level. So okay. when I reach out to diocesan leaders, it could be um, a, a Catholic school superintendent. It could be anybody on the staff there. Um, it can be uh, even office of development and stewardship and just kind of like, Hey, I'm, I'm just calling. We're, we're trying to, find ways to serve your people better to be an extension of you because the reality is like as much as you'd love to serve everybody in your diocese sometimes there are gaps sometimes there's just you know you wish you had some extra help and support and we're just trying to figure out what that is and then we can gather a lot of feedback from the higher level of leadership and then from there we can call those individual parishes and ask questions that we know kind of already apply to them. Right. So it's when it comes to doing that secondary kind of research ahead of time, it's based on some of the feedback we've already received. And so Diocesan like what? The parish pitch. I'm sorry, what? Diocesan homework to like. Yeah. Yes. Got it. Yeah. Um, and, and of course there are individual needs at each parish. Some parishes are rural. Some parishes are uh, multicultural, just very dynamic as far as all the, the different um, ethnic groups and communities that they're serving within their parish. Um, so, I mean, there are different needs. And I, and I think that's another one of the questions that I, I typically ask 
would be um, what what kind of multicultural needs does your parish have, or um, do you have families in your parishes that um, don't speak English as their first language? Right. And uh, how are you serving them? Or um, another question is, um, how are you helping support families at home? Um, we know that religious education and um, evangelization and catechesis is not just a parish approach. It yeah. takes a village. It takes the domestic church at home. We have to have that follow-up. Most people are always in agreement. They're like, yes, you're preaching to the choir. But then the question, so can you just kind of give me a little heads up as far as how you guys are doing that? Because if I don't know what you're doing as a parish, I'm not going to be able to even make this phone call beneficial to you. So right. let's, I would like to save you some time and be respectful. And hey, if you could tell me a little bit about what you're doing, I can give you more of a, a heads up, straightforward approach. Perfect. Well, Mike and Rich, I want to keep an eye on the time. So we're at 1230 right now. If I see a few questions from our finalists. If you guys have another 15, 20 minutes, I'd love to start introducing them to you and hear about what they work, what they're doing. Does that work? Sure, absolutely. Awesome. So Mike, this is uh, really appropriate timing. So I'm going to introduce you to Karina in a second, because when you're talking about what uh, you're hearing parishes struggle with, at, like linking with the domestic church, she is in that mission. Um, so Karina, why don't you give a sense or two about what you're doing and then pose your question. And if you can, I'll do it. Okay. So I'm Karina Montreal, and I am creating my prayer corner, which is a home altar and prayer kit to give people the process of learning how to pray so that their kids can really experience Jesus as their best friend in their home. So learning each day a little experience that they do to be able to then by the end of a month of doing it, really know how to pray and have that be a part of their daily habits. So that is what I'm doing in a very tiny nutshell. Um, but, and it would be a kit that would be sent to the home. And then eventually have more experience packs that go along with other things that the church has to offer because the church is a wealth of information. Um, so, but my question was, I'm not selling directly to parishes necessarily at the beginning or even like major institutions. Is there a way that you guys help could help me know how to navigate how to sell to individuals how to get it to directly to consumers hand instead of through the parish to the consumer if that makes any sense rich you want me to take this one or do you want it i i can i can grab this that's all right so there's there's a number of channels in the sense of um you know, where, where people are buying things, are they buying other things? What does that specifically look like? Uh, for Mike and my role, primarily, we're focusing on institution institutional selling. So we're doing mostly churches or other Catholic organizations or dioceses or, or those, those kinds of things. But we've seen a number of our solutions. So for example, like you think about our, our books, and, and so many of our books are sold on an individual basis. Well, a lot of that comes at the recommendation of a pastor. Well, would you like to read something about this or having options or availability there? I know our, our parish offers a series of options of things that they can do or information about uh, uh, Catholic materials or Catholic content that would be useful. So getting things in the bulletins, getting things kind of using the institution, if you will, to help co-market the uh, products and solutions that you might have. If you have a pastor that's bought in and connected to what you're doing, saying, look, that this, this prayer corner, uh, you know, um, I, I just think, I go back and think of the, 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 the movie, um, what is it, it's about the prayer closet. Um, anyway, but I, I, it brings that sense of, of mind to it. So if you can draw that connectivity in with the pastors and with the staff who are connecting with those individuals saying, you know, look, as, as your DRE, you know, this is something that would be a useful tool for you and for your family. Now, I'm not saying you have to use it, but this is something and this is where I find it useful, you know, and so just kind of that secondary um, word of mouth kind of marketing encouragement because it's something that you saw as, as a resource or a tool that could be advantageous. And, and I, I'd like to add uh, just um, a couple um, things to that in when it, I want to use a, an example of our current situation. So with, with 
everybody kind of being at home in, in churches not fully um, open, that we, we see the current needs. And so what, what we've done is we've put together a series of, let's say, webinars that can provide dioceses um, with support and ideas and suggestions. And these are all free to register for. And then I've reached out to dioceses and I've said, hey, um, we, we'd love to support you in the work that you're doing. Would, you, would any of your people find this webinar helpful? And what they would do is they would share that link for us to all their people. And so when you have a good working relationship with a diocesan director, and I noticed um, one of the questions was like, which of the diocesan directors do you work with? It really comes down to like, so what kind of solution are you sharing? And who's going to find that beneficial? So in the case of, let's say, um, a family approach at home, which I just noticed is another question, um, we're, we're really focusing on that a lot right now. And yes, OSV does have um, those resources and that curriculum program. But to, to just let people know, like, hey, we have a solution, but we also want to engage in conversation. We want this to be formative. This doesn't need to be just another commercial. And so when we offer workshops like that, we get the exposure that, that we're looking for in sales, as well as we become like that leading expert in the field uh, of evangelization and catechesis, like, oh yeah, OSV, they, they, they've done their research and they're, they're giving us all these great ideas. And then if we get the diocese to really promote that type of offering, then they're doing some of the work um, that also benefits our next steps, which would be to follow up with, you, with each of those parishes or schools. So sometimes that diocesan relationship approach can, can uh, get us places that the individual approach would not. And so Mike, it sounds like you guys do a lot of content marketing to be able to do follow on sales calls from that. So that sounds, I, I bet there are people that are drooling over that type of reach that you have uh, with, with those individual groups. So you saw Nancy um, and there's also a Michael O'Rourke. They're all building products that are all in support of the, the domestic church. So you have three, three of the teams um, really well represented here with that. Um, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump to Paul's question because it's also been seconded by Dan. So we're moving from domestic church products to more uh, back office software uh, for parishes. And that's what both JM and Paul represent. Paul, if you can go audible, I'll invite you to come in and just explain a little bit of what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm going to turn the video off. I wanted you to just see that this is why we're turning the video off. Um, so yeah, so our product is um, Father Josh. He's actually working on this right now as we speak. Um, is he designed it to do pastoral care and criminal prep for um, inside the parish? So. going to visit and the volunteers and everything. But anyway, the decision maker, when you guys are, are networking through this, what is the ultimate decision maker? Is it, is it the priest or is it uh, the office manager or do you see a blend of both? Uh, it, some of it depends on the solution itself. So there are certain things like offertory envelopes that are very much more driven by the business manager, office manager type environment. Uh, when it comes down to software, I would say the business manager, office manager has a strong say or direction to it, uh, but that the, especially as cost comes into a play, a lot of times the pastor will be involved. So I, I would say there's kind of a, a combi combination for many of our solutions. Uh, bottom line, I would say uh, if the pastor is on board, the pastor will be the influencer to say, no, from an office manager business perspective, this is what needs to happen. So if you've got, if you have the ear of the pastor, the likelihood of it coming through is a lot stronger. I think across most of the board, um, 
Uh, but again, there are definitely, there's influencers in a parish that can influence that pastor decision. So that influencer could be the office manager, the influencer could be somebody on the finance council that financially this makes sense. Or from a pastoral perspective, somebody in the pastoral council, pastorally, this is going to make sense that this, this investment is, is, is worth it. So there could be a combination of, of people. Some pastors lean very, very heavily on their business managers or their uh, DREs or on uh, a trustee or somebody, they'll lean on a person or two for guidance or direction directly. Uh, but again, a lot of times, I, I would say a good majority of the times, either the decision is going to go to the pastor or it, it almost always has to be at least mentioned to the pastor if this is the direction that we're going to. So if you have their way in, it's, it's a lot stronger with an influencer you know, so if you've got two people, the business manager and the pastor on board, you're going to move forward a lot more quickly than one or the other. Uh, but the pastors typically have a pretty strong way in on, on many of the solutions that come through. Sure. And that's, that's very consistent from what we've found. But our scale of what we found is very different from what your scale of what you found. So I wanted to see if that was kind of weird. We're seeing the same things. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. And, you know, I think it's important to mention, too, that some, some pastors are a little bit more involved with everything that's happening in the parish as far as that micromanagement approach where they're just like they, they know every little detail. They want to be involved in every detail. And then you have other pastors that would delegate a lot of those responsibilities to each of their people. And they're like, hey, just come back to me and, and just for the heads up. But as far as the evaluation process, I think it's really important to ask that question when you're working with a parish. And it's like, if, if you wouldn't mind sharing with me, like the, how the decision process would work and uh, like, maybe are you going to uh, reach out to a committee or a parish council or uh, that way I could serve you a little bit better. So, I mean, it's really important for you to understand the, the, the decision process and to ask the question. Awesome. Thank you, Mike. So, I'll pass it now to, to JM to ask your question. Jose, I'll make sure you get final question in here. And then I think we'll, we'll wrap it up from the finalists as well. So um, for Mike and Rich, I'll, I'll, I'll continue to steward it. JM, you take this and I'll keep my eye on the time. Sure. Bye. Okay, quick question. I'll try to make it as brief as possible. From your guys' perspective, uh, or the first one is uh, Parish Council. Uh, do you find that that derails anything or how have you guys navigated around that? Uh, and more of a, uh, if that's not really a thing, the, the other question I have is around that parish influencer. Sounds like the majority of what you all do is sell direct, meaning you're calling, you're, you're, you know, you're working directly with the person either over the phone or in person. But on the digital side or marketing side of things, has your marketing team defined a parish influencer, created a persona, or defined a digital audience for that? Have you figured out what makes the parish influencer? So uh, from a, pass, a parish council standpoint, uh, the, the quick response is I've never in all my years worked with anybody on the pastoral council. If there's going to be an influence, it's the finance council. It's more on the finance side than on, on the, the parish council. Um, I can't think of a time, I mean, there might have been recommendations from somebody in the parish council to bring us in for something, but in the sense of the influence, very, very rarely will it go to a, a parish council from a decision-making standpoint. Uh, from an influencer standpoint, and it does, but that doesn't mean that one of the influencers is not on the uh, parish council. Uh, from a persona standpoint, our marketing department has put together kind of a, a persona per product uh, so we kind of know, okay, here's the business manager. The business manager profile is typically Betty Sue, who's 68 years old and da 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 down the line. So we've got to kind of got a good gauge of what the persona of each uh, personality, if you will, in a parish is, especially as it pertains to each particular solution, because you want to keep that in mind and relate to that persona, especially if you're marketing to them or calling to them or, or working with them on, an, on a regular basis. Awesome. Thanks, Rich. And I don't know, JM, I don't know if you got to say just a sentence or two about what you guys are doing just for context. Uh, sure. We have a platform that is uh, 
develops the parish a parish website, but it's built around a relationship management system. So you get a dashboard uh, based on content and and different feeds, so that you can pair all the needs of a parish from you know uh, sacramental data with uh, with an additional layer of relationship management to understand who the parishioners are. Awesome, thanks, Jam. All right, Jose, you are the last one. If you could just start with a sentence or two on what you're doing, and then we'll wrap up. Sure. Okay. So, Juan Diego Network, what we do is we we create and produce podcasts, well, audio programs, some for radio stations also, uh, to evangelize Latinos, form them, entertain them. Right. So, I normally we have three sales to make. One is make people aware of the statistics of how things are going for well, Latinos, regarding Latinos in the church, right? A lot of people don't know the majority of the young Catholics are Latinos right now, and almost close to half are Latinos. So that's a first sale, no? Then the second one is podcasting or audio programs. Uh, that's another sale because a lot of people also don't know a lot of the stats and well, all the, the trends and how it's growing and the impact it really has several times more than video and retention and, and a lot of uh, the cult factions that come afterwards. And then, well, of course, the third one is why, why us, right? So my, my question was not relating really to this, just wanted to have a bit of the insights of how you normally are updating yourselves or innovating in the, on the sales process. Right now our funnel, like our sales have to be very personal because of these three different aspects that I, that we have to sell. So I normally start with an interview of the, uh, interviewing them uh, on a podcast or inviting them to be on a virtual summit. And I start a personal relationship in which we start talking about Latinos and stuff like that and what we're doing with different clients. So it's a long uh, sale. You know? um, just wanted to, to see from your side what you guys are, are trying and what you normally do on, on these, yeah, innovate, trying to be innovative. Uh, in in sales that are not like just selling a, a specific product, but more a, a, a relationship based on relationships. I know it was a loaded question, maybe. Oh, I I we just had a webinar the other day where we invited a diocesan director to share her experience as far as a, a, a relationship or a partnership with OSV, and I think um, that it that has always been not just a great testament to what we're doing, but um, when it comes to relationship, when you have that comfort level, when you can ask um, maybe a, a pastor or a, um, a school principal to be part of your podcast, to be part of, you know, hey, I value you and your, the, the, the conversation that we have had so much and I look to you as an expert in your field and you invite them into this partnership, you invite them into this conversation, that speaks, that speaks volumes. And, and what you're doing, I think is great as far as, you know, inviting them in, in into this partnership and this relationship, because in the end, um, the relationship is going to help you sell, not just having an awesome product, and, and serving a need, but that relationship is what's gonna carry you through. So I, I think that's, that's awesome. We have a number of uh, diocesan and parish solutions that are highly consultative and they, they take longer to sell because they are kind of that longer term planning. It's not a simple, I'm, I'm gonna buy uh, a pamphlet or a, uh, wh whatever it's going to be, I'm going to, I, I need to trust you that you're going to be the to be able to consult me through the challenges and solutions even though this could be a changing environment for us at our parish or for, for us at the diocese so there's there are definitely a number of uh, solutions that we work with parishes and dioceses on on that level with and and it takes time but again with those relationships and with the things that you have uh there's definitely opportunities for that and uh and and again for the right fit and as as you're working with people, they'll, they'll see those as uh, continued opportunities for, for them to grow as, as a parish or as a diocese. Rich and Mike, thank you guys so much for this. And I, I'm glad we got the finalists to be able to tell you about some of their stories too, because 
Uh, startups are hard. Startups in the church might be even harder. And so this type of experience that you guys are giving even here are basic questions that you ask. Know that content marketing through webinars is pretty effective. Here are ways of thinking about the relationships and the, the buying personas of the different people you're, this is, this is gold for a lot of these people. So I really appreciate your time. And um, if we ever have any follow-up questions, is there a way to engage OSB in general with just some of this type of question, line of questioning, or is it um, some better orchestrated through Joe or someone like that? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, you can contact us directly. I think, uh, John, you've got our email addresses, so feel free to forward the email addresses or our phone numbers if you want to talk through further questions about what we've experienced and kind of the evolution of of where we've been. Uh, I mean, I know that when when I first started with, uh, with OSV, that we were very young in the increased offertory space. We had a solution for a number of years that was doing a time talent treasure and we had decided that we were gonna carve out the treasure piece. So we completely rewrote it. It was a really kind of a startup uh, product, if you will, for us. And so we kind of had to reinvent the sales and the marketing and all of the pieces that went around it. So uh, I can definitely talk to you about, you know, thoughts and ideas and kind of how, how, how we started. And, and, and just the long and short is, I, because I worked at the diocese, I picked up the phone and just called different people at diocese, picked up the phone and called got a parish list and started calling parishes and creating connections and then you know really trying to find out what what people needed and, and where a good fit would be awesome thank you rich mike thank you as well all right you guys yeah. have a good weekend um, i'm happy for any follow-up to anything i can do to help great and if you want to stick around i can send you the links that kendra tierney and uh luke I, luke from catching foxes is coming up in just a few minutes but uh, otherwise Great weekend, guys. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. guys. All right.